Hi guys, it's Tom, and um, I'm kind of making this video because I saw something uh, on one of Greg Porter's videos, and I think this may help uh, when you have instances where this would apply. Now, Greg had a locating pin on his convertible top and what he did was he he let's just say these are two pieces here you know as an example and he welded them together uh, where it had broke and, and that's fine that's a good fix if the hole but sometimes uh, you have trouble getting it to hold uh, the first time he welded it it broke and and now he's welded it again and it's probably going to be okay but this is just for future reference for him and for anybody else actually that may have similar issues so let's say that this is a broken piece here okay and uh, and you want to fuse it back together but it's you know say it's short you know you're not dealing with much it's just an example well a good way to put things like this together is to put an internal pin in it and there are three different ways you can do it um, one way is to use a dowel pin okay this is a dowel pin it's precise it's a precision pin it's also case hardened uh, which means the outer outside of it is going to be hard um, you're not going to touch it with a file uh, see there I, I can't mark it with a file. Uh, it's hard. Probably Rockwell's around 6062. Okay, that's a hardened, case hardened piece of steel. But if you cut the dowel pin, um, its center will be soft. Okay, or malleable, ma ma uh, whatever the word is, machinable. So I don't have the right size dowel pin to show you. What, what I'm talking about but it's just an example okay so you could use a dowel pin this is a reamer I'm not sure what size it is let me uh, look at it here just off hand Let's see here. I should have a set of mics over here somewhere. I don't see them. Now, well, regardless, it looks to me like it's about an eighth inch dowel pin or eighth inch reamer. Okay? These are high speed tools. This is high speed. Hardened high speed. That means it'll be hardened all the way through. Okay? So what you would do is you would drill you a hole in each end of your two pieces. Okay? You would need to use a center drill. This is a small center drill. This is a number one. Okay? You would need to use a center drill to start the hole. So you would be drilling here and then you would use a drill, a proper size drill uh, you know, maybe leave yourself, um, I don't know, a 64th of an inch left to ream, okay? And then what your reamer does is make the hole straight. Then you could use a dowel pin of the proper size. You do that on each end, and then you could put the pieces together, okay? And, and what that'll do is that'll transfer the load away from your fused point okay now a dowel pin is one way this is a socket head cap screw okay you could cut the head off of this and you could drill and tap a hole in here so you would screw this together on one side and then you take the other and screw it together as well and uh, 
you know, that would almost do it without welding. But then you could weld it around and, you know, it ain't never going to come apart. Or, one, the third option, and I don't have one here, is a roll pin or a spring pin, which is a hollow pin, okay, that would have a slot down it. That would be a spring pin, or I always call them roll pins, okay? Uh, a roll pin is not a, a very precise way of, of locating a, a part, but it'll all, but for what for for what Greg was doing it would be perfect and that would be probably the fastest and easiest way to do it because a roll pin uh, you know or a spring pin they kind of press in uh, you want them to have a slight press and and the slit in it is very forgiving if you don't have the tools to machine the exact size diameter that you need okay so anytime you have two broken pieces if you can put a pin, a screw, or any other type of something to to locate the pieces halfway, you know, this way, you know, and and you could stick them together and then actually do your fusing, your welding around the outside edge. It it is that's that's what you want to do because it takes the stress off the weld. Um, you know, your stress will be on the pin uh, that's in, in, in the internal pin uh, would would absorb shock or or any pressures okay that's that now I was up in my attic checking or looking for a bunch of these little parts here you know like these taps and and uh, stuff like that because um, you know my background is tool and die I am a tool and die maker um, I can make any damn thing. Um, that's I'm not trying to be egotistical or anything like that. But that's just the way I am. Um, and um, I've talked to a lot of people. A lot of people I've talked to on the phone and things like this, and email back and forth about some of the things that my background and whatnot. Um, so I dug up a couple other little things here, and I thought I would uh, share them for whatever reason you know we live in a world of automa automation uh, you know Greg was talking about his Carmen Ghia you know his design was in the 50's you know they didn't have CNC anything or anything like that well my background is is tool and die the old-fashioned way I guess is what you would call it uh, it's hard to believe that <clears throat> you know in my my lifetime I've seen the tool and die industry uh, well there are no job shops anymore because there's no there there's uh, everything is CNC so here's a couple of examples okay this is a part we used to make a detail we always called it a detail it's a detail we used to make okay you can see get this reamer here you see how intricate this part is okay um, I don't know what it was used for or anything like that. All we did was make it. There's a little slot right here. Okay. Very shallow. There you go. We got some holes in here. Um, these would be screw holes so there wouldn't be high tolerance. Here's notice right here. This is a chamfer okay tight tolerance chamfer um, I know because I made these parts and and when we made these guys uh, we would probably get an order for I don't know 20 or 30 of them okay notice here's an edge right here that's ground these surfaces are this is a ground surface this part is hard. It's tool steel hardened. Um, I think this is A2. If I remember right, it probably is A2 because I can tell it's, uh, you know, this has been sitting in a toolbox, guys, for 25 years. Here's another hole. It's threaded. 
Uh, I'm not sure what size, but I'll guarantee you that sucker is little. That's probably a 440 thread right there. That'd be a number four SAE screw, 40 threads per inch. Okay, very tiny. Very easy to break a tap in this situation. All right, now this hole here is of great importance. This is a locating hole. And what this hole, this is a precise hole. I don't know the size of it. Um, we would, uh, well, it would be a reamed hole. We would ream it. The slot right here. Let's see if I can get it so you guys can see it. The slot right here would be precision. Um, I don't remember the tolerances on it, but it would probably be plus or minus half a thousandths or maybe as much as a thousandths, the dimensions. Now, all the surfaces on this piece. When this piece was made, we would... I'm going to turn the light on so you guys maybe can see it better. I don't know if it'll help or not. This would start out as a block. The chamfer right here would be put in when it was in block form. All the holes would be put in when it was in block form. Okay? And then we would send it off and get it hardened. Or, or then you would actually you would actually do all your cutting and all this and that and then you would have to leave material on on this uh, on a surf any ground surface you would have to leave a material. Typically we would leave five to ten thousands because the piece will move when you heat treat it. Uh, but after it was heat treated and brought into the proper Rockwell hardness, uh, you know, the piece would become very stable uh, as long as you didn't get it too hot when you were working it. Okay? Now, you would insert a pin into the locating hole here, and all the dimensions off of the piece, all the ground surfaces would be ground to the pin. The pin is it, okay? So all held dimensions would be off of a, of a central locate, excuse me, a central locating point, which is right here. All right, this is a difficult piece to make. Um, very tedious, and that's what we did. We did tedious work, okay? And this one's scrapped for whatever reason. That's why it was in the toolbox. Uh, it probably has a dimension that's off and uh, so it was scrapped. Now, let me show you some of the tools that we used to make stuff like this. Okay, this is an angle block, okay? Notice it has reliefs in the corner. All the corners are relieved. You can see where crashes have occurred on a surface grinder. Any of these spots like this, these are crashes. This was made in about 1961 by my father. We never bought any tools. You made your own tools. This is going to be made out of hard, air hardening. Uh, I believe it's A2. Uh, it's got his name stamped in it, right there. Uh, he made three or four of these, uh, this size, and he made um, three or four um, that were twice as big as this. It's the only one I have left. The others are in the shop that we used to have, and whoever owns the shop now um, owns the tools. All right, so this is made out of air hardening, and this block, this angle block, is balls on. And when I say that, um, I mean it is perfectly square, it is perfectly parallel, in every aspect, every surface, within a, within a tenth, a tenth of a thousandth. That is very difficult to do by hand. It would be ground on a surface grinder, uh, and every once in a while you would tune it up. You would use this on a surface plate, you know, uh, which would be a piece of granite, and you would have your indicators 
around it and you would slide all your stuff and this piece here would be uh, clamped one way or another depending on your surfaces that you were using or the surfaces you were working on and you would use this to grind things square um, you know and and all that again this is within a tenth maybe even half a tenth of, of a thousandth of an inch so it's within a half to one ten thousandths of an inch in squareness it's you might as well say it's perfect okay the reason it doesn't rust is because of the steel it's made out of it's made out of A2 which has a high chromium content in it and A stand and it's air hardened steel so that means you would be able to put this in a furnace in about 17 1800 degrees is where air hardening starts to um, uh, molecularly get hard and and then that would be uh, at, uh, and you would leave it soak in that heat for a certain amount of time depending on the size of the piece and then uh, you would bring it out and anneal it usually when you bring a piece of air hardening out it'll be around a Rockwell scale of about 65 to 66 maybe even as high as 67 and then you would anneal it down to around 60 or 62 okay this is a precision a very precise piece of steel and and I'll guarantee it's hard here's a file you cannot mark it with a file okay so this is one of the tools that you would be used you would see clamp things to it okay and uh, this is one of the tools you would use to make parts absolutely perfect you know this is a lightning hole uh, there's some threaded holes here so you could um, put a stop on it say you could put a piece of, of uh, you could put a piece of steel on here and then uh, use it as a stop you know it would hang over and you could slide your piece against it so if you were doing multiple pieces you know you would have a, a reference point okay so everything was thought out screw holes put in um, you know for any situation that may arise here's a V block we've probably all seen V blocks uh, this one was made by my father um, he had several of those to also I think we had about five or six of those there's his initials also made at about the same time it's also air hardening A2 uh, precision ground I would say it's within a thousandth of an inch all surfaces parallel and square now here is a piece that when we get back to making something like this here's a piece this was one of the number one tools this is a sign vise this was made by my grandfather my dad's dad there you go there GW Benefield Gerald William Benefield alright every piece on this is handmade nothing is bought and it's actually broke uh, and that's why it's kinda in pieces um, so what what happened to it was let me show you real quick I just have this setting in here this is how good of a fit it is guys this this is a slip fit these are ground surfaces what happened with with the vice is what's broke about it is it's not really broke uh, when you make stuff and you make it so that the part that wears um, is is easily replaced and that's what's wrong with it you can see how loose this is if you look in here you'll see this is brass that's a brass um, bushing okay that it's pressed in there and threaded 
and the reason why that was made like that is because uh, the wear on the vise from tightening and loosening it, loosening it will wear the threads out on it. So you want to put something that will wear, brass will wear, and so you would just replace the brass bushing is all you would do. Uh, you would take a piece of brass and you know uh, put it on a lathe, turn it down to the right dimension. You want to put a thousandth or two press on it, press it in there and then uh, tap it. Okay. So let me kind of slide this together here again and I'll show you exactly how we used something like this. This was probably made in the 30s guys uh, by my grandfather. And you can see how sloppy that is. And what will happen is, uh, especially up close, see there, it's coming through. Again, these are slip fits. These are precision. This is a precision piece. Okay, and then this is the tang for the bottom of it. Okay, all ground, hardened. The stuff has been setting forever in toolboxes. Um, and then you see the bottom of it here. And uh, you would put the tang on here on the jaw. It would go in here and you would screw it down. And then uh, that would be a precision slide for clamping. This piece here goes in to. Uh, Actually, I should have put this piece on first. It slides on. See, there's a recess counter bore in here. That would go on this piece here, and that would lock your foot against here. It screws on. Okay. Now, that's just how it's made. And, and here's the beauty of it. It's a signed vice, okay? It's, a, it's double, okay? You would, uh, you would find the sign of an angle, whatever angle you wanted, you would look it up and find the sign of it, okay? If you've all had some math, you may or may not, uh, some trigonometry, uh, which is all geometry, trigonometry, that's what tool making's about. Uh, you're a math wizard, um, basically. Okay, notice, I need to... Uh, I need a flashlight. All right. Notice right here, you have a round piece here, and you have a round piece on the corner, okay? So if you put that the sign of an angle you would look that up okay and that would be one inch in the book if you had a book you would look it up and it would be one inch uh, is what if you look up the sign of an angle I don't know uh, say it's 45 degrees and say the sign of it is 1.000 I'm just guessing here I'm just I'm not looking it up then right there if you have 45 degree angle and say the sign of it was one inch you would take and multiply, this is a five inch sign right here. The distance between the centers is exactly, and I mean exactly, five inches on these rounds, on this vise. So what you do is, like if you were wanting to put a 45 degree angle on something, I'm just using that as an example, I don't know if one inch is exactly the sign of a 45 degree angle. Um, but you would multiply that by five, so that would be five inches, 5.0000, okay? So you would take and have a straight edge. Let's say the table is straight edge here. That came up, okay? And we would push this against it. Bam, push it against it. And you would take a five inch Joe block setup, okay? Roughly. I may have been about right on uh, one inch, I don't know. 
So you would take a five inch Joe block and set it up against this face too and then you would push it against it and it would be on the rounds here, these round pieces. And you would have exactly 45 degrees here, okay? You would be exact. But here's the beauty of the, of the vise. The vise also has another sign bar. Let's see where the round has been taken out of here. Uh, I probably have it. But it would have a round piece just like here. If you can see that. And one here that would be screwed in here. And it's also, this is a six inch right here. So that'd be a six inch sign. So you would find the sign of an angle and then you would put a Joe block set up here and push your vise down on it. Okay? And then you would be at the exact angle. You, so you could go two different ways with this. You could go here, this way, and up and down. And then it becomes very plain that you can put this piece in here, okay? And you can grind whatever doodad, die dough, or whatever you want to put on it by changing the angle of your vise. So this is a precision piece of equipment that could not be purchased, okay, when it was built. You couldn't purchase anything like this. This was hand handmade by my kin. And, and that's how we did stuff. Um, that's how we did the work that we did, making little stuff like this or whatever it was that we were making at the time. This is just an example. You know, this thing even has, notice the radius right here. You know, that's in there too. See, so you would put that in there as when it was in block form. And then you would cut it all out and machine it. So, just a little taste of my background. Um, all the work, all the grinding work would be done on a surface grinder, which is a very dangerous machine to run. A lot of people lose their fingers. Um, kind of a background. Uh, I don't know if it applies to much, but you know, it's just uh, something to talk about, I guess, conversation piece. Um, very difficult for me to go up in those toolboxes. I got tons of tools, literally tons of tools. I got four or five Gerstner boxes full and two or three Kennedys. A Gerstner box, if you don't know, is a wooden box, handmade Gerstner. They were made out of oak and things like that. They were beautiful boxes. Uh, they're probably worth a lot of money, but they'll stay in my attic until I'm dead and then somebody else will deal with them. So, anyway, just a little taste. Uh, and that's that. So, you guys take it easy.